thank you very much, and thank you all for um, attending. It's nice um, that these meetings uh, continue and to see so many uh, familiar faces um, and, uh, you know, people changing the world. And um, I believe that uh, in this uh, audience, all of us aspire to a society in which human interactions uh, are based or uh, would be based uh, on consent and on consent uh, only, rather than the alternative, coercion and extortion. Because consent is at the foundation of a society in which people interact via love, friendship, commerce, that is a gentle society, that is a libertarian society. But is it possible that in any society, um, to, uh, is it possible to accept that consent is the sole legitimizing factor of human uh, interaction, the sole um, principle by which we should organize uh, society? And let me start by uh, telling you a story, a true story. Back in March 2001, a German uh, man uh, in his uh, 40s um, ran ads on a forum for kinky people um, <laughs> saying that uh, he would like to find someone, a male, um, good looking, who would accept to be eaten by him. And what is quite amazing is that he got several replies. And one reply, uh, several people came to his house. Uh, in the end, they decided, you know, they backed down. They decided not to uh, uh, proceed. Uh, but one man, uh, called Bern Brownness, uh, decided that, yes, he would be eaten by uh, Armin Midas. And um, the correspondence is quite interesting by email, because Bern Brownness says, I'm not going to back uh, down. Um, there is only one way forward through your teeth. And they, uh, they met at uh, my wife's place. Um, they had sex. Then um, uh, my wife slashed the penis of Brandes and they flambéed it in uh, cognac. And uh, by then, uh, uh, Brandes was uh, already too weak to eat and to um, end more rapidly uh, the proceeding, um, my vice uh, slit his throat. The whole thing, in its gruesome aspects, were videotaped by uh, my vice. A few months later, someone realized that something had taken place and suspected that you know these two had done the deed and alerted the police. The police raided the house of my vice and found in his freezer uh, bits of human flesh, which my vice would um, eat from time to time with a good bottle of wine and had a little celebration, candles and, uh, and so on. Now, the problem is that there is no law in Germany against cannibalism. So what could they held, hold against my vice? And in the end, they decided that it was assisted suicide, which is illegal in Germany. Because consent had been given at every step of the way before going to visit um, uh, my vice uh, in this, this place, uh, Rondus, um, uh, sold his car, um, wrote a will, which he deposited with the notary public. Um, all the correspondents said that you know he was okay with the whole thing, and the tapes that the jurors uh, vision uh, watched, uh, one of them actually fainted, um, showed that at no point did Randes try to you know say stop, escape, and so on. Consent was given. The two men were professionals, they were not mad, uh, they had healthy lives integrated in society, good jobs, um, both were bisexual, but that is not a sign that you are incapable of giving consent. So 
what can we say about something like this? The uh, prosecution service in Germany appealed the sentence of manslaughter, assisted suicide, um, which called for a maximum nine year in prison, which my guys was condemned to, and they're on no ground at all, other than the fact that they are uh, deeds, uh, actions, that are so abhorrent, so repulsive, that we don't care whether consent is given or not. We simply have to act and punish the people who commit these, these deeds. And uh, my vice was condemned to life for murder. Now, if we consider what consent is, if we sort of try to unpack the notion and see what, what it contains and what has your consequences that it has. Um, let's start with dictionary definitions. It's always a good place to start, you know, what people understand by uh, consent. Now, one definition which I've got from the internet, consent is a non-coerced agreement to what another person proposes. Another definition, consent is to freely accede to or acquiesce in what is being done. Now, how do we know that people acquiesce in or consent to what is being done? We've had the case of my guys and Brenda's. But are there ways to establish that someone is consenting to what's happening? Now, there are sort of four tests that generally in most jurisdictions uh, people in the law <coughs> would consider. The first one is that consent must be given prior to the action. A recent case um, in this <coughs> country um, was about a uh, medical doctor, a surgeon, who when performing on a uh, woman found that she had a lump in her uterus which could possibly turn into cancerous, uh, uh, develop into a, a tumor, cancerous tumor. So he removed the uterus. The woman was young, she would no longer carry babies. When she woke up, she sued the doctor, she sued the surgeon. And the uh, jury found against the surgeon because the uh, co uh, consent had not been asked and could not have been asked because it was during anesthesia that this um, uh, lump was found. Um, but you should have simply you know, put everything back, wait for recovery, and then ask the woman again, you know, now this is what we found, what do you want to do? Um, consent has to be specific. Specific in the sense that if, for instance, um, a beautiful woman asked me to have drinks at her place at midnight, it's for drinks, not for something else. Um, consent has to be informed. If I lend you my car, I would like to know, and I have a right to know, what it is that you are going to do about, how long are you going to uh, use it for, uh, and, and things like that. In other words, it's not an open checkbook. And finally, and this is the key element, consent has to be freely given. Now, how do we understand, how do we know that consent is freely given? Now, the obvious example is, uh, um, well, uh, under duress. A, that we would all agree on. But a more complex example that is very often quoted by a lot of people is, well, hang on, I am uh, starving, I have a family, and they are starving, and there is this Mactadora, or there is this factory that has just opened there, and they are offering me to work 10 hours a day 
for Ebola flights? Do I consent freely to work for these people? Am I not put under duress exactly in the same situation as if a man would point a gun at me and say, give me your wallet? Now, the test there, and probably this is not new to you, but let's you know, discuss it. The test there is whether the person who is offering me a proposition, who is asking me to consent, is the same person who has created the circumstances that will cause me to consent. If you take the case of a robber who says, your wallet, or I'll stab you, he is creating the condition where I am forced to give him the wallet or be stabbed. Whereas the maquiladora or the multinational who is opening up their faction in this country where I reside, this poor country where they have not created my poverty. They, are not they have not created the poverty of the country. They offer a solution to circumstances that they didn't create. So they are a solution. Whereas Robert is a problem. He creates a problem that, the, uh, that he then offers to solve by taking my wallet and not stabbing me. I think that is a, a good test to know whether there is uh, duress or not uh, duress. And this individual who will consent is the iconic figure, the central figure of liberal political philosophy, the autonomous individual. Um, the autonomous individual is deemed to choose their lifestyle, his or her lifestyle, sexual preference, spouse, to have children or not, a career, a political affiliation, and all consumer goodies. And denying this autonomy for political philosophy after the Enlightenment, say for uh, liberal political philosophy, it is a very bad thing. Denying the autonomy of an individual is something that we object. But who is autonomous? An obvious example is inmates in prison. Now, they are autonomous. That's why they are in prison. That's why they are not in a psychiatric hospital. They are in prison because we consider that they decided freely to commit whatever action has condemned them to uh, prison. Uh, they could have acted otherwise. They could have not robbed the bank. They are not in the position of a cashier who was who had a gun pointed at him and gave the money to uh, the robbers. So these um, people have their autonomy only limited inside the prison. That is the limit we put to uh, their autonomy. But you have people who are momentarily, momentarily uh, incapacitated because of a shock, because of um, a, uh, you know, they're under some influence of alcohol or, or, or drugs. Uh, they suffer the stroke. Now, what do we do with people who are meant to be autonomous, but who cannot consent at that moment. Um, in the same way, you have people who are permanently and mentally impaired. What do we do? They cannot give consent, but they need or we need to make decisions for them. And the criteria generally accepted is that we take the decision that they themselves would have taken if they had not this problem, whether permanent or momentary. Um, we put ourselves 
in their position, in their shoes, so to speak, and we say, well, this is the way that they would want to be treated. And of course, we can make mistakes. I mean, if there is somebody who is sort of, uh, you know, bleeding on the pavement, I will call an ambulance. They would give, uh, you know, the person a transfusion of blood or something like this, and we would discover afterwards that it was a suicidal Christian scientist. So um, that's not what he wanted. But these things uh, do happen. Uh, in other words, we do not know always, certainly, what the other person would have wanted for themselves. And children. We consider that children cannot make a decision, cannot consent to a decision. We do to children a lot of things without requiring their consent. You know, send them to vacation in places they hate, we uh, send them to school where they don't want to go to school, and so on and so forth. The thing is, we don't put ourselves in their shoes. We decide from where we are what is good for them. We impose on them an image of what they should or ought to become when they are grown up. And we say the trajectory from here to there is going to be this, this, that, and the other. Because um, we treat, or we hope we treat, these children as um, ends in themselves. And uh, we consider that it is a good thing for them that we do this for them. Now, of course, very often, uh, and certainly at the level of governance, when uh, you hear people to say, uh, uh, people saying, politicians saying, um, the you know children are the future of this country. That's the future of this country. They are kids. They are children. They will be grown up. To say they are the future of this country is already assigning to them a position. In other words, treated treating them as means to the future of this country. Mm -hmm. They are like you know, soldiers on a battlefield for the victory. But even with adults, with their capacities intact, there are problems about giving consent. And many people are, will say that giving consent is an illusion. It's at the margins of a debate of you know, free will and, and so on. Are we really free? Are we not simply the product of our education, uh, of our environment, uh, and so on? But leaving this aside, even if we consider that you know, we, there are no external circumstances and things like that that will predetermine what we are going to do. Um, there are still situations where we ourselves are not sure that we can give consent. St. Paul, famously, the apostle, said, I, can, I see the good, but I ought to be doing it, and I'm not doing it. There is something in me that resists doing what I should be doing. You have um, bad habits that we can't get rid of. You have addictions. Do I consent to smoke? I don't consent to smoke. I do everything I can to stop smoking. And yet, I'm still smoking. Actually, I don't smoke. But, um, same for alcohol. But even, take another situation. Um, again, beautiful woman who, um, you know, I'm giving her all, all my money, and uh, she says, you know, I'm really, really, really in love with you. Now, am I consenting to giving, you know, all my money to this beautiful woman, or I am a lecherous old man uh, who is taken by the nose by an adventurous? Both. <laughs> 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 Maybe, maybe, but there is um, something that you don't 
you know, you, you could say that is it the rational individual in you? Is it the good Christian shell, you know, with all these big personalities that I've been <laughs> who is doing uh, all this, again, no beautiful woman is taking all my money. Um, ignorance. Ignorance is another uh, factor. Um, William Reich, Reich uh, the uh, German psychoanalyst and so on, who ended up, I mean, he died from the crazy. Um, but um, he said something which I believe is quite profound. He said, the, the question is not to uh, know why 10% of the population rebels. The hard question is why the 90% don't rebel. <laughs> Why do they accept the situations that they are put under? And they are brainwashed. There is a culture of obedience, an ideology, whether it's religious, you know, whether it's the, all these theories of social contract. You know, there is a social contract that you have signed and you have to abide by this. When did I sign this social contract? You know, please. Or there is a natural law. You know, it's in nature that you must obey higher authorities and, and things like that. So, um, all these things that we absorb since we are children, do we consent to all this? Or is it simply that we ignore that there could be an alternative? Um, Ivan Illich, who is a wonderful writer, said, you know, school is the advertising agency that makes you believe you need society as it is. And that's right. It starts at school. It starts even before. And all this is important because consent, consent of a government, is the foundation of a regime that you want everybody to, to adopt, of democracy. Now, when you think of it, do you consent to the government? You vote. You are given, you know, the power to vote. Um, you are given the power to choose a representative. And that representative may not win the election. And if elected, he may not champion the bills that you support. And these bills, if he do, does champion them, may not be passed into law. And if they are pass into law, if they go on the books, they may not be implemented as you think they were going to be by unaccountable civil servants. And they will be reviewed by judges sitting for life. So what is it? What is it that you have consented to? And the question is, or the judgment is, that if servitude is voluntary, are not the slaves more despicable than their masters? If servitude is voluntary, what sort of human beings uh, who consent to this servitude? So, to conclude, there are valid tests to measure consent. So, <clears throat> I think that when we think of it, if we really want to analyze every situation, um, the criteria that I have given you will establish, as well as any of these um, situations can be analyzed, will establish that consent has been given, that consent is valid, if the situation meet all these criteria. And because only interaction by consent corresponds to the image that we have of us, human beings, as persons, and because a libertarian society is the only one that demands that all human interaction is based on consent, then, therefore, only a libertarian society is fit for human persons. 
Thank you.